what did we do with the amount of September? September 82? Yeah. When we opened? Then we want to show me the dead big club, which used to be the Raz Kelter, the name of it. I said, what is this? I'm going to buy this. I said, what? Your mother is waiting for the <laughs> diploma. Yeah. During the day, I mean, literally, if I put my finger on the, slide it across the roof, because you smoked back then, it would, I mean, it was, it was disgusting. It was disgusting. Shit hole. <laughs> Toilets leaking. Throw up all over the place. Beer on the floor. You know, plastic cups. But it was an institution for a different time. I think it was one of the, it was the best club in Colorado for a number of years. Well, it was magical in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It was, it's hard to describe because on the one hand it was so packed that it, it was, it was just an experience and everyone who was of the demographic were, you know, going out at the time would know the debut. Peter Elsey in the DJ booth. Yeah, Lee, Freddie, Darren, all the guys. Paul, down in the basement with their their mohawks and their leather jackets and their combat boots with some of the nine inch nails. And... But the difference was what I'm saying is back then, um, it wasn't about, it was about being at the place where everybody else wanted to be. It was fantastic. You heard amazing music, two different kinds, on two different floors. Then they expanded to a patio, and then they expanded the patio and made that bigger. And it was just this, it describes, I, I actually don't really have great words for it because it was just a magical place. But uh, Deadbeat was the beginning of the empire. And every week it would just be 2 to 20, 30. It was just one night out of the blue, <laughs> like 2,000 people, let's say, sitting in a line from the door, up the parking lot, down the alley, you know, waiting to get in for 50 cent beers, a quarter beers back then. You can. You can never make it with those prices these days. He did it. opened up the 1082 the back behind the speakers where everybody stand on stage was literally bars and a and two plywood that closed and it was like a, you know the heater up in the ceiling uh -huh. and people would come in and, and everyone's in their coats and they're standing there waiting on Tuesday nights and um, sitting by in front of the heater you know so they could keep warm until enough people because we do two three thousand people so then the body heat right. made it hot and then we open up the doors and the air would cool off the club. Yeah. I came out here on, my brother went to DU for uh, pharmacy school. I came out here to visit him and I came to church and vinyl 
and I, my brother was, at one point in time asked me to move out here. When I went to Vinyl, I was like, I, I wonder, if I'm going to move out here, I'm going to work at this place. Yes. I remember actually in 94, Regis, was, Regis moved me over here from, uh, from 1082. And um, he's like, I want to show you something. So we're walking over here, and we're going past the doors on Lincoln's side. And he stops, and I kept on walking for a few ste steps, and I stopped. I look back and he's opening up the door and I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah, you have Tiesto, Armin, Nirvana Buren, you know, Paul Defold, you know, it's just like the list goes on. And they continue to come here to play, you know, after all these years. So, I mean, this, is, this has been, uh, you know, epicenter of dance music uh, for the world. And, you know, it's a market that everybody wants to come and play and everybody knows about the church. Switching the nights, you know, we kind of had a lineup where, you know, you knew Friday night was going to be Latin night at vinyl, or you knew Saturday night was going to be house music, but at the same time, Saturday night's house music on the main floor, but you can go upstairs to the rooftop and second floor and have hip hop going on, and then you can have drum and bass and dubstep down the basement with a separate entrance, you know, but across the street you have, you know, indie indie night going on or golf night over at Bar Standard, and over here. You know, we flip flop Fridays and Saturdays for Latin nights and house music, and it was, I mean, it just worked really well for us, for sure. And it is like a machine. I mean, at our best, we operated at a high level, and I'm extremely proud of that, because that takes a team of people who are constantly honing in on those skills and figuring out a way to reach the necessary people who would appreciate what we're trying to put on. Um, the crowd there is just amazing. I mean, they come, they come early. You have a line at the door before you open. They all know your name. I know all their names. A lot of them come, you know, in costumes or dressed differently. They're very respectful. It's the music and the vibe and the scene too. It's like, it's not aggressive. I mean, you have like a goth style nature in a couple rooms. You have new stuff, which is like the synth wave uh, movement that's been going on. Um, then you have like 80s and then you have like parties like lip gloss that have been, gosh, what? No, we didn't have our party. I remember, I remember we did like MGMT at Bar Standard for our 18th anniversary of lip gloss. What is it, 20 years now? That's been like, that's the longest indie dance party in the United States. And we have it every Friday night at Milk Bar. It's just, it's just kind of cool. It's just. <laughs> It really has the feeling of a family. And I think because of that, um, everybody is really motivated every day when they show up to work uh, to do their best and make sure, um, you know, we keep this reputation um, of being Denver's night, nightclub district. You know, like it's amazing to have a club the last 20 years uh, this long. There's not many clubs. This might be the longest running nightclub in the country, but one of them. I haven't seen, you see things, 
New York pop up and you know after a decade they, they go but it's like but he, he stays on top of it because he's ahead of the trend he's got good people working for him <laughs> I mean, right now, this is the only time that, you know, you can't do what you, you do for all these years, you know, you're on a forced break, but you can't do anything. I feel helpless. Like, there's... I think that everyone has their own way of blowing off steam, and um, there's a pretty good chunk of people that blow off steam by partying, and um, there's always going to be a place for, you know, parties to happen, and I think nightclubs are can really be a safe place, like if they're run correctly, like these ones are, it can really be um, an important safe space for parties to have. My 2020 has been such a hard blow because closing down the clubs is just not something that was even fathomable. But um, the, again, obviously it's for a very good reason, but. Yes, of course. Dude, you gotta get out there, you know, you gotta. There's a different feeling. I mean, you can't replicate it anywhere else. You can't replicate it at your house or anything like that, no matter what kind of good sound system you have. You gotta... Being social is a part of the human factor. I mean, if you, you take this kind of stuff away, live music, whether it be DJs or bands or whatever, or different experiences, you meet people at the bars or the clubs that become like your friends away from friends, family away from family and stuff. I mean. We've got people that come to Milk Bar that have been consistently coming to Milk Bar for a decade now, like every Saturday night. And, and it's a group of like 50 to 100 people that are just, they love what we're doing. Um, yeah, I would, I would say clubs are a necessity um, just because uh, for me, music's like one of the driving forces in my life. You know, mm -hmm. it's my biggest passion and so much of that is uh, the live aspect of it. Like you just experience music so much deeper um, when you're sharing it with other people and you're all dancing together and feeling each other's energy and uh, clubs provide space for that. Um, so I would, I know for me personally, I would absolutely say they're a necessity. Um, just something that brings people joy and brings people together and gives them a sense of community. I'd say that's absolutely necessary to everyone. I wish I could say we'd give them 40 more. I'm creeping up on my milestone <laughs> next week. Told you today, be 50 fucking years old. I, just, I recently just did it again for Regis during this whole COVID thing. We started, uh, we started the Lincoln Lots, you know. And I had to put together a whole new business, all the functionality and everything about it. I had to, I had to, I had to pretty much start a whole new business for it. It was, uh, man, it was tough, and then I was doing both, just trying to and dealing with all these guidelines and stuff. Man, it was, 
it was an experience, but uh, most definitely, I would, I would definitely do it again for sure. Yeah, there's times where it's work. You know, it feels like work. You know, we have these really gigantic private event parties where you gotta you gotta study up and figure out exactly what you have to do because it's gotta be you know by the book and everything's gotta be crossed off and you know. But other times it's just a more natural thing. You know, it's like I can't explain it. It's the journey more than the uh, the destination. And uh, I've learned that. Um, and, uh, you know, just, you know, you know, we're here for, the reason why we're here is because of the love of the industry, love of music, love of um, having a good time getting together, and, you know, sharing that experience with one another, hopefully. And, um, you know, coming together as one big happy family. It's silly to have tears thinking about a party, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's your experiences in life are what make you who you are. They teach you resilience in hard times. And uh, to all the people that sort of kick my butt and me into shape when I didn't know better, or I wasn't um, looking at things the right way. I thank them for all the people who's, uh, who let me their ear when I needed to talk, um, to all the people who listened to me when I was trying to kick their butts and get them <laughs> into gear. I thank them for listening. Um, I, I'm just really proud to be able to work in this industry, but not just this industry, to work for SoCo. Because it is a family of people who don't always agree, but bring so much to the table. And to our customers, I hope you're doing well. You know, it's it might sound trite to talk about a nightclub in the middle of a pandemic, but it's almost the perfect analogy to what we're dealing with. I mean, you step aside from everything that was going on, from the craziness of life, and you're forced to slow down, to be cautious, which is the antithesis of what, you know, a raucous nightclub is. But it really does make you take stock. And, you know, if the roaring 20s are coming back again, then we're gonna be a part of that. I had wish I I wish I had written things down. I wish that I had written down my experiences because unfortunately I've forgotten a lot of stuff now. What we built as a group, as a family, it can never be done by anybody else like that. Either. It doesn't happen like that. You know, it's, it can never be duplicated. Why is that? I don't think anybody's got the balls to do it like we did it back then. Well, my uncle, you know, a lot of it 